Well, good evening, church family. We're so glad to be with you on this Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm glad that you are able to be with us tonight. And if you'll remember last week, we started uh, a study, uh, continuing our study in the book of Colossians with what Paul thinks about ministry. And I told you it would kind of be a two-parter. And so uh, we're going to finish that up tonight, what Paul thinks about ministry. Ministry was very near and dear uh, to Paul. He did not think he was worthy to be a minister of the gospel, but yet he was so appreciative that he had the opportunity to do that, and we talked a good deal about that. But I want to begin with just a refresher from last week for just a, a couple of minutes. And I, so I want to start with the scripture, Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29. That, I, I think the scripture just kind of sets the tone for our study and, and just kind of puts us in the right mindset and heart set for uh, study tonight. So Colossians, take out your Bibles, your iPhones, your iPads, however you follow in the scripture as we look at Colossians, the first chapter beginning verse 24 through 29. Paul's talking. He says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's affliction in behalf of his body, which is the church. He said, I was made a minister. I was made a minister. Remember, we talked about this last week. Paul didn't have a choice. He, he couldn't do anything else because God called him to be a minister of the gospel. He said, I was made a minister of this church according to the commissions from God granted to me for your benefit. I was called to minister to this church as a minister of the gospel to benefit you. That's what he's saying to the church at, at Colossia. He says, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Many discussions about the mystery as we look from the Old Testament, the mystery it talked about, we find they come to fruition in the New Testament. That mystery, we can sum up the solution to the mystery in one word. His name is Jesus. To whom God will to make known what the wealth of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. Jesus revealed to the Gentile. The mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may present every person complete in Christ. For this purpose, for this purpose, I also labor striving according to his power, which works mightily within me. Paul telling the church, he says, he says, I've been set apart, I've been called to be a minister of the gospel to this church and to other churches, but one of, specifically to this church so that I can share the mystery, the great mystery that I have found in Christ Jesus. Paul never, ever through his ministry lost the wonder that God would call him into ministry, and he never tired of talking about that to anyone and everyone who would listen. So if you remember last week, and I don't want to go back to last week and relook at everything, but we looked at the source of Paul's ministry. We looked at the spirit of Paul's ministry, the suffering of Paul's ministry, and then we closed out the study last week with the scope of Paul's ministry. So tonight, what we want to do is start with the subject of his ministry. Very important uh, to that we understand what the subject was. So let's go back for just a moment to Colossians verses 26 and 27, and we see the subject of Paul's ministry. He says that is the mystery, which remember, just don't overcomplicate that. We can sum it up in one word. You could, you could substitute one word every time it says mystery. You could substitute Jesus. The mystery is the gospel, and Jesus is the gospel. The mystery which had been hidden from past ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles 
is the mystery that is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. The message Paul proclaimed in his ministry was the mystery which had been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been revealed and manifested to his saints. There are some things, God, we have to understand. God reveals some things uh, to us. He reveals some things to certain people. He reveals some things to no one. Some things he does not reveal. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, so that we may follow all the words of of his law, of this law. God reveals other things only to certain people. Uh, Psalms 25, 14. In other words, God holds back some things that, he is, that are not revealed. Then he reveals, Psalms 25, 14, reveals certain things. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them known his covenant. In other words, Certain things he does not reveal. Some things, according to Psalms 25, 14, he reveals only to those that fear him and love him and have a relationship with him. In other words, he reveals some things to only believers. There are many things that are revealed to believers that lost men and women will never know. Never, as long as they're in their lost condition, they will never know. It's like the word of God that, that's revealed to us. The, the word of God is is not understandable to those that do not have a relation because with Christ because it's a revealed word. In other words, God reveals to our spirit and our heart. We've talked about this before. It's the way even sometimes for us as believers, when we read the same scripture more than once, we read it twice, three times, ten times, a hundred times, God chooses to reveal certain things to our heart and our spirit about the revealed word that we need for that time and that place that we have understanding of. Uh, Proverbs 3.32 says, For the de devious are an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. In other words, he's not going to reveal himself to the lost other than the fact that revealing himself that they need a Savior. Still other things were hidden like we we talked about in the Old Testament, but now have been revealed in the New Testament. New Testament calls them mysteries. Those things are revealed. And the mystery is Jesus. The mystery is Jesus. And here's the, here's the essence of the mystery. We saw it in the scripture. It's Christ in you. It didn't say Christ in someone else. It said Christ in you. And then it goes on to say the hope of glory. The only hope we have is in Christ Jesus. Did you know that? If we put our hope in anything else, then that hope is going to fade away. It's going to fail. The only hope we have is in Christ Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the gospel. That's, that's what it is. The, that's, that's what we see when we look at the subject of, God, of Paul's ministry is the fact of the mystery that he's revealing to those who will listen. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the gospel. Then we see this, we not only have the scope, but we see the, 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 uh, the style of the ministry. And he says, and we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. Paul's passion was to proclaim him who had done so much for him. Paul's passion was to always proclaim Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed the things we love the most, we talk about the most? Have you ever thought about that? The things we love the most are the things we talk about the most. For, for uh, husbands and wives, many times it's their spouse. We love our spouse and we talk about our spouse. Many times for parents, it's their children. We talk about our children. We show, you know, for, for grandparents, what's the, what's the one thing you always, anytime grandparents have a discussion, they start talking about their grandchildren. They, they, they start pulling out their purse or their wallet and they start showing pictures of their grandkids, things they, they love the most. 
And so we see, you know, there's different things that we love and different things that we prioritize with our love. But the things we love the most are the things we talk about the most. And Paul's passion, his love, his passion was for Christ. And that's who he chose to talk about. Paul used two terms. He says admonishing and teaching. Admonishing, it speaks of encouraging counsel in the view of sin and coming punishment. In other words, Paul admonished those to, to find Christ. He admonished those to believe in Jesus Christ. He admonished those to surrender their sin, turn over their heart and their life to Christ, and to, to have a real personal relationship. That's the admonishing that he did. Admonishing, it speaks of encouraging counsel in the view of sin. He encouraged in the view of sin, in the view of what men had in their lives and women had in their lives to, to turn their heart and life over to God. And that's, I believe, is the primary responsibility of any church leader is to, to admonish those. Acts 20 verse 31 says, Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul's saying that I that I was so broken for the lost that I shed tears every day, every night. I shed tears for the brokenness of the lost. My heart was broken for their brokenness, their separation from God, their, their separation from any eternity with Christ. When was the last time our hearts were broken and we literally cried for lost men and lost women, cried for a, a family member who was lost that you'd been witnessing to and witnessing to, cried for someone you loved so much that all you wanted to do is have them see Jesus the way you did. So they, he admonished, he used another term, he said teaching, referring to imparting, uh, in this case, imparting a positive truth. When we teach the Word, remember the Word. Anytime you who are teachers out there, anytime we're teaching the Word, we're teaching the truth and we're imparting the truth into a person's life. Colossians 3, 16, it says, Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. To God. Paul blended those two things together. He blended the admonishment and the teaching together to present a doctrinal truth that comes out of the Word of God. Doctrinal teaching was invariably followed by practical admonishment. You teach the Word. It has any time the Word is being taught, there has to be practical application that you can apply to your life and to your heart to be a to either to find Christ or to find a better relationship with Christ. So the style of his ministry was to, to teach and to admonish. Then we see the sum of his ministry. Look what it says in verse 28, the latter part. It says that we may present every man complete in Christ. The goal of the ministry is the maturity of the saints. Ephesians 4 Verses 11 through 13. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all obtain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of of Christ. In other words, we can't we can't stay immature. We can't stay as they the scripture describes it on the milk of the word. We have to grow in our relationship with Christ. We have to mature just as a baby starts out their life uh, on mother's milk. So, sooner or later, that baby graduates from mother's milk to eating solid foods. And as we continue to grow and to mature, 
that consumption of the truth of God's Word becomes food for us. To be complete or to mature is to be like Christ. As we develop, as we grow into being Christ-like, as we're sanctified through our relationship with Christ, we mature. Although all Christians strive for that lofty end, no one on earth has arrived there yet. We haven't arrived. It's a process. Philippians 3.12 says it this way, Not that I have already grasped it all or have already become perfect. You never will. He says, But I press on. If I may also take hold of that which I was even taken hold of by Jesus Christ. I press on. I press on to the to the mark of the high calling. First John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is. You see, we are saved. We are justified when we are saved. Then we go through this process of sanctification as we grow closer each day to the Lord, to this point of glorification when we see Jesus. Christians move towards maturity by feeding on God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Do you know that God has put good works in your path when you find Christ? God establishes good works in your path for you to do. Christ offers spiritual maturity to every man and every woman who follow that path of good works. Next, we look at the strength of ministry. Lastly, this, is, this brings it all together. Colossians 1.29, for this purpose. What's the purpose? You know, we do a lot of things. Have you ever thought about this just a minute? Uh, I kind of get going, and I, man, I get going 90 to nothing sometimes. And we do a lot of stuff. Have you ever, have you ever come to the end of the day, and you're just wore out? And you look back on the day and you think, I don't know what I did and I really don't know what I accomplished, but I'm wore out. It's because sometimes we get to doing so many things and we don't really have a goal or a purpose in what we're doing. And we look back and we think, well, I didn't accomplish anything today, even though maybe sometimes we did. But look at what he says here. He says, for, this pur- for Paul's purpose, he said, I also labor striving according to His power, which works mightily within me. Never forget that as a child of God, greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. All power and strength that I have as a child of God comes from the empowerment of God in my life. No one can successfully serve Jesus Christ without the power of God working hard in their life. Also, every child of God should work hard. Uh, you know, we, we, we sometimes, uh, we think we work hard, but sometimes we're just fooling ourselves. And, and no Christian ought to be a lazy Christian, whether it's a, whether it's a pastor or whether it's a, a leader or whether it's a lay person. We'll never fulfill the ministry that the Lord has called us to do by being lazy. He intends for us to work. It says, work out your salvation. That doesn't mean salvation comes by work. It means because we're saved, we got work to do. Because we know Christ, we got work to do. Because we got a gospel message to share with the lost and dying world, we got work to do. Paul says that he strives according to his power, which mightily works with him. That power is Christ. All of his toil, all of his hard work, all of his labor, was useless outside the power of God in his life. So to the Corinthian church, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 10, he says, 
but by the grace of God I am what I am. How many times have we said that? I just, I am who I am. That's, you just gotta, gotta live with. That's just who I am. I am who I am. Paul, but Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's God's grace that's made me what I am. It's God's grace that's working through me. He says, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. He says, I worked harder than anybody, but God's grace worked harder even than that. That is, as bad as I was, as rotten as I was, as sinful as I was, God's grace intervened. God's grace intervened. And I was able to do what I was able to do. God gave Paul the strength to work hard at his ministry. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When I accepted Christ, I was crucified with Christ, is what it says. And I no longer belong to me, I belong to him. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I am new in Christ. I belong to him. I've been crucified with him. I no longer belong to, to myself. I belong to him. One of the problems we have, folks, is even after we're saved, we still want to act like we belong to ourselves. And we don't. We belong to Christ. We belong to Christ. Well, these eight aspects of Paul's ministry, I think really we, we apply those to Paul, but I think those, those eight aspects that we've looked at of ministry over the past two Wednesday nights really apply to every believer. All Christians serve Christ in some capacity. Paul's message to all in this passage was in, we see in Philippians 4, 9. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's saying, hey, you know, he, Paul doesn't mind saying, look at me, look at what I've done. Don't give me the glory, but give it to God. But you can look at me and use me as an example if you want to. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. That's what he's saying. Look at me. Look what you've seen. Look what you've heard. Look what I've demonstrated. Practice those same things. And the same peace of God that I have, even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the struggle, even in the midst of, of all that's going on around us, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, I hope, hope you've enjoyed these last two uh, Wednesday nights as we've looked at Paul's ministry calling in his ministry to the church. I hope you have a great week. I hope God blesses you, blesses your family, and I hope that God puts someone in your path that you can share Jesus with. God bless and have a great week.